once again it's prophet tom here to share on the holy ghost i've titled this the holy ghost and fire the upper room experience todd smith was a very conservative baptist had passed it for a number of years and had an average size church but deep inside of him was a hunger to go deeper with God he was not satisfied you know the Paul the Apostle Paul says I hunger for more of God with a passion I want more of God well that's where Todd began to reach into a local Pentecostal pastor who pastored a small church began to hear about Todd Smith and his hunger for more of God and so he arranged to meet him then eventually he invited him to one of his services as Todd Smith came into this environment that a good sudden Baptist would not enter came into a tongue speaking church a church in their worship that seemed very disorganized perhaps a little like the day of pentecost but in that environment todd smith hunger began to intensify the pastor called him to the front and put his finger just on his forehead and Todd Smith hit the ground speaking in tongues from that moment forth his life was totally transformed no longer could he be the man that he was before walking into that church and you know that's what this study is all about today I believe in speaking in tongues like Paul I speak in tongues more than you are but the the speaking in tongues is the tongue is the key that leads us into the spiritual realm into the supernatural realm into the very throne room of God and what happens in that throne room of God is more than speaking in tongues. But more of that in a moment. Let's get back to Todd Smith. Todd returned to his church and began to share his experience with a number of his people. And then one Sunday, on the altar call of his Baptist church, 75 members were supernaturally baptized in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. Not many days after this experience, uh, the board of the church and the Baptist community gave him the left boot, boot of fellowship. In other words, asked him to leave the church. So he went down the road and started the church down the road. And people began to gather week in and week out. And in this small little town that he was part of, he began to have the largest church in that town and in many other large cities. Then one day, they were having prayer. You see, the strength of his church the strength of the anointing of God, the strength of the power of God is found in our relationship with God. We've been teaching this week uh, on ministering to the Lord in our daily devotion. And this is what they began to do in their prayer time. They would minister to God. They would come and they would just reach out and praise and worship Almighty God, seeking for more of God's glory to be poured out of them, just as the great apostle of all time, Moses, did. And even Christ himself, uh, who spent all night 
speaking in tongues as we learnt a couple of weeks ago. One day they were in prayer in the church and there was a prayer meeting and large gathering and they were walking around the building worshipping God, seeking God, exalting God uh, and just, just, just being absorbed in the glory that was within that room and, and Todd was on the platform and they have a large baptismal pot, pot uh, on the platform and all of a sudden he was drawn to that uh, baptismal font. Uh, it had no water in it, but as he looked uh, at that baptismal font, uh, what he saw was that the font uh, was full of the glory of God. And God spoke to him and said, through this font, thousands will be healed. From that day forth, people would get baptized and it got to the point that the lines were so long people were coming from all over America the lines were so long it would take sometimes an hour before you would be baptized or in this case rebaptized you see if you were sick you'd get baptized in this baptismal font now God did many miracles on the altar and many miracles when their prayer meetings and many miracles in their church but there was something a special about this baptismal font. Well, there was a lady who came forth from another part of America who had heard about this and they'd, her and her husband drove all the way and she had 50 tumors in her body. She'd had the x-rays. You could see the tumors all through her body. She went down into that baptismal font, came up feeling no pain, feeling as though she was totally healed. And by chance, she had to go and see her specialist the next day. And so when she went to see her specialist, uh, she asked them to do the radiation or do the treatment that they had done, which the CAT scan, which showed up uh, these 50 tumors. And so they redid the CAT scan. And not one tumor was shown on that body. She was totally totally healed you see the work of Pentecost was more than just speaking in tongues I think today there are thousands if not perhaps millions of tongue speaking believers who have no power in their life whatsoever who have no change in their life whatsoever they still suffer from fear especially in this time with the coronavirus it is amazing to see the amount of Christians that I know that are bound by anxiety and fear so what happened in that upper room what happened in those 10 days that seems to be missing from our church today our churches today they have a form of God but yet do not know God for you see if we don't live in the spirit realm we cannot know God we can know about God and we can be good people but we still carry our sicknesses. We still carry our diseases. We still carry our complaints. Uh, we still carry our anxiety. We still carry our emotional hang-ups from our past. You say, how can you say that someone who is born again doesn't know God? Well, it's not me that's saying it. It's the Word of God. And we'll see that in a moment from Romans. So what happened in Pentecost or on Pentecost? What happened in the upper room? Let me give you another story. There was a man and by his name does escape me that uh, as a young person had it all. He was on the sports teams. He was uh, smart. He had it all. But one day he was hit direct in front by a car and was left basically 
insane. It became so bad that when he regained most of his functions, but he couldn't remember as much and he couldn't do any of the sports that he turned to crime and guns and drugs. And, and he ended up in jail and he became known as the madman. And then one day, two Christians visited him in his locked cell. He wouldn't be allowed out of his locked cell. And one man, two Christians visited him and spoke with him and and as he put his hand on their Bible, all of a sudden, the presence of God filled the room and he was totally healed. His mind became normal. His functions became normal. And, uh, and so he was transformed in a moment of time. But the authorities wouldn't allow him out of this nut home. And so he, God said, run one day. And so he ran and he ran out of this supernatural, just like Peter did in Acts chapter 12. And as he ran, all of a sudden this car was coming for him and it was the social worker, it was the, the, the psychiatrist and the car was coming straight for him and hit him. And it was like he passed through the car. The woman herself testified to this. But she looked behind the car and here he was running and God said to this woman, let him run. Today that man pastors a thriving church and preaches the word powerfully. What happens with a Pentecostal experience? What happens in the upper room? What happens when we obey the voice of God and we go alone? Well, if we look at the lives of the disciples, I believe we begin to get a picture. You see, the disciples themselves understood the supernatural when they were with Jesus Christ. They saw in Christ himself, uh, they saw the workings of the power of God as they looked at, at Jesus. Um, you know, uh, they, they saw Jesus um, when, when Jesus came to meet them. There was something so radiant, something so special about them, so that when Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19 says to them, Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishes of men, it tells us in that verse immediately they left their boats and their nets. They didn't even fold their nets up. They immediately left and followed Jesus Christ. They watched uh, as he, he went from town to town uh, and they saw the workings of miracles that he did. Uh, he saw, they saw the healings. Uh, they saw, for example, the woman with the issue and the, the issue of blood and the woman broke through the crowd uh, and touched the hem of his garment uh, and all of a sudden she was transformed and Jesus said, who touched me? Power has gone from me. They heard the words of Jesus uh, when the four friends uh, let the man down through the roof of the building uh, and Jesus said, there is power in this place to heal the sick. They saw the blind being healed. They saw Bartimaeus crying out. And that Bartimaeus was brought to Jesus and he prayed and his eyes were open. And then Jesus turns to them. And he looks at his 12 in, uh, in Matthew chapter, seven, uh, chapter 10. And he says this. He called the 12 together to him and gave them authority and power over unclean spirits uh, to cast out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. So not only did they see the power in Jesus, not only did they recognize the power in Jesus, but now for a season they themselves experience uh, 
what it's like to live in the supernatural realm. They experienced what it was like uh, to drink uh, from the power, to allow the power of God to flow out of them. It says in verse 7 of chapter 10, And as you go uh, preaching, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what Jesus said to them. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And so here they learn another lesson. They learn that this authority, this power that is invested within to them is not just for them, but must be given out. I've written a book last year which is called Releasing the Glory from Within You. You can get it on Amazon. Releasing the Glory from Within You. This is a powerful principle of God. You know, we can't just drink in and drink in, but we drink in to give out. And so Jesus turned around and he said to them, Preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then put your hands on the sick and heal them. Put your hands on the lepers and, and, and cleanse them. Put your hands on the dead people and raise them up. Put your hands on those that are demon possessed and cast the demons out. For this is the power, this is the anointing that I have given to you. And then in Luke chapter 10, we have my favorite, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And here we see that now Jesus sends 70 out. He sends them out two by two. And he says this, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then go down to verse 17. So, you know, he sent them out to prepare the way, if you like. And so they go out. And just like, uh, you know, J Matthew chapter 10, uh, the same principle is given here. Go out. Preach the kingdom of heaven. Go out, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. This same principle, this same anointing, this same authority was given to the 70. So in verse 17 we read, And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now listen to what Jesus said. And he said to them, I love it. I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. <clears throat> listen to me. If we are sitting in the church, going to church once a week or once a month, and we lift our hands and we sing a few songs, we put our ties into the offerings. We listen to a sermon and we go home. And even if every morning we get up and we read a chapter of the Bible and we pray, let me tell you something. We will not see Satan fall from his heaven. The only scripture, the only mention of Satan falling like lightning from heaven is when they went out and released the glory and released the power that was within them so that they healed the sick, they cleansed the leper, they raised the dead, they cast out demons. You see the apostles, the, the, the 70 here went out and raise the dead. Raising the dead is not something that is new. Christians today are amazed when they hear about someone raising the dead. 
David Hogan and his team in Mexico have raised in the last 20 years, have raised over 700 people from the dead. It is not something different. We just need to live. We just need to experience the upper room experience. And so it goes on and it says this, Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now listen, look, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all powers of the enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't rejoice because you speak in tongues. Rejoice that your life is being renewed daily. Rejoice that your life is being transformed from moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment. Let's go back to the disciples to illustrate this point. And in John chapter 19, uh, sorry, chapter 16, and verse 7, we read these words. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father uh, and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Still, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you, all things that the Father has a mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. What a statement. Think on it for a moment. Peter could think back and say, what does he mean? I remember the time that he fed the 15,000 people with a child's lunch, just two fish and five pieces of bread. I remember holding, like it were, the eye of a, of a, of a little fish. And with that eye of a little fish, I fed a thousand people. Can anything be better than this? Well, Peter could have said, well, you know, I remember the time we traveled up to Lazarus' house and he'd been dead four days and Jesus stood at the tomb and they rolled away the stone and, and he spoke and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the man that had been dead for four days comes hobbling with the death clothes still wrapped around him out of that cave. Can anything be better than this? You see, observing the miraculous is not what God has planned for your life. Observing the supernatural is not what God's got planned for your life. What God has planned for your life is not observing but being a vessel so that the supernatural flows through and out of you. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. 
the last words of Jesus Christ to the 500, his church. And he says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, I have, you have heard of from me. So Jesus is now instructing them. And they know what it's like. They know to a point what he's talking about because they had followed his life. They had seen the miracles that he'd done. They had seen how that he had raised the dead. They'd seen how he cast out demons. They saw in Mark, in Mark chapter 5 how a man with two or three thousand demons was delivered in a moment of time and brought back to his sanity. But not only had they seen it, but they had a taste. Perhaps one of my mistakes in life was one day I tasted pavlova. And any time sweets are offered today and on that table is pavlova as one of the choices. My choice is pavlova. Well, as an 11-year-old boy, as I have shared with you, I had the joy of tasting the Holy Ghost. I had the joy of seeing my life transformed in a moment of time. And because I tasted, I want it every day. I hunger for it every day. I have a passion for it every day. I come on here not just to speak to you, but also to be a vessel, a vessel where the Holy Ghost will flow out of me, a vessel where the glory of God will flow out of me. I have seen literally hundreds healed through this media as we preach the word of God. Leprosy falling off people, blind eyes open, a cancer in mouths coming totally clean and tongues regrowing. Because we hunger, hunger for more. And in verse 8, Jesus tells them what that promise is. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here we see that they're going to get power. And Matthew, which I've shared with you, 26 and verse 64, tells us that that power is a, in, is a shakabaraba, is a impartation of God himself within our lives. God is holy. That means there can be no defilement. Verse 5 says this of chapter 1, And John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days have you shall be baptized, you shall be imparted, your life will be transformed, your life will be totally, totally transformed. And that's what happened in the book of Acts. If we go to chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one, they were all with one accord in one place. You see, this is one of the biggest problems in the church today. We are not of one accord. We are not of one accord. We need to be one. No matter where we are in the world, no matter which, which part of the world we're at, you can still be one with me, you know, through this channel, even just through the Spirit, uh, even without seeing each other. Every morning I pray for you. Every day we get together, my wife and I, and we pray for different ones that have needs that are let us know. But in prayer, in fasting, it's no good coming together in prayer and in fasting if we're not of one accord, in one unity, in one spirit, in one place. And suddenly, when that happened, suddenly, there came a sound, a sound that waved throughout the city. A little bit like the sound that waved through Beirut yesterday. That explosion that happened there. Basically, they tell us it destroyed a city 
Well, on this day in Acts chapter 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it destroyed a city. Oh, not physically, but spiritually. It turned it upside down. It turned it from a heathenistic city, a humanistic city. It turned it from a, a city that, that, that was controlled by sin into a city where thousands upon thousands upon thousands were saved in a moment of time. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled, you see, inside. When I have a drink of water, it doesn't stay out here. It doesn't go upon me if I was to pour it on my head. It goes in me and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance and this filling was so transforming this filling was so absorbing uh, that they could not stand on their feet uh, they were as drunk men the public said uh, they some couldn't walk at all and those that could walk uh, staggered here and there and everywhere else uh, but peter stood up uh, and said these men are not drunk as ye suppose uh, seem it's only nine o'clock in the day but this is what was promised. This is the Holy Ghost empowering. This is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But let me backtrack. What happened in the upper room on those 10 days? You know, the Gospels tell us that the night that Jesus was to be arrested, he broke bread with the disciples but he himself did not eat and they had supper and then they went out and they went to the garden of Gethsemane and he left his disciples in one point and he said to Peter James and John come with me and they came with him and they went a little journey and then he said wait here and pray with me and he went on further and the burden was so heavy upon him that he fell to the ground and and there he remained for the next hour seeking and praying unto God and and he prayed these words father if it's possible let this hour pass from me but not my will but thine be done can we pray that prayer oh you know it's home group meeting tonight well you know I'm a little tired and we've got the coronavirus perhaps we should not be meeting out in groups <coughs> excuse me perhaps we should just stay at home well, that's what Peter and James and John did because Jesus went back and they're sound asleep. They didn't know how to pray. But come into Acts chapter 2. Jesus is taken away and he goes up into heaven. 380 of them walked away and said, well, that's it. But 120 went to that upper room. And I believe that as they entered that upper room, they entered into the spirit realm. They entered into a place they'd never been before. What they'd experienced in Luke chapter 10, in, Acts, in Matthew chapter 10, was nothing to what they were experiencing right now. There was something special. And the longer they stayed there, it grew a cleansing, a purifying, a transformation. The Peter that denied Jesus Christ in front of a little girl a few days time was to stand up and preach boldly before a multitude. And it said 3,000 gave their heart to Jesus Christ. Well, that could have been many times over because in those days they only counted the men. But Jesus, Peter stood up for boldness. There was a transformation. Something happened in that upper room. You see, they entered into the spirit realm. And many scriptures I can give you, but our time has already gone. But day three, 
the intensity of that room got more. Day five, the intensity continued to climb. Day seven, the intensity was so great and so powerful that I believe even by this time, though 120 in that upper room could not stand. Day 10, at this point, that room that they were in, in that house, a large house that could accommodate over 120, that room that they were in could no longer contain the power and the presence of Almighty God. And there was like an explosion and fire consumed the house and fire remained on every one of the 120 in that upper room. Their lives had been transformed. And they staggered out and Peter stood to preach the gospel. Our time's gone and I haven't got even to point one, but let me give it to you and we'll pick them up next time. What happened in the upper room? A changing flow for the world happened in that upper room. 3,000 souls were saved. I could give you illustration after illustration, but we'll pick that up next time. Secondly, a powerful gift was imparted within the believers, within the church of Jesus Christ. That gift was the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost lives within us. And we'll enlarge on that next time. Thirdly, transformation happened. Transformation happened. Lives were changed. You know, in, in Acts, sorry, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, and this is Paul writing, and he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you know, Peter had denied Jesus. At the time that Jesus needed him the most, he denied Jesus. But in that upper room, Jesus showed Peter, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not to those who know about Christ Jesus. Not to those who know the theological, the Greek words and meanings about Jesus. But to those who know him, who know him, who know him who know him, a transformation. Paul experienced this himself uh, when in Romans chapter 7, and I think it's 22, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. My, my, my spirit desires to do this, uh, but my body wants to do this. Uh, but no longer, as soon as had he said this, that he moves into chapter 8 and he says, But I'm not under condemnation. I'm not under condemnation. There's a transformation that happens in our upper room experience. We're taken out of the body. You see, the world doesn't mean a thing to us anymore. If we have truly been baptized in the Holy Ghost, if we have truly had an upper room experiencing experience, houses and cars and provisions and bank accounts, they no longer have any meaning to us. For we are no longer of this world, but we live in a world above this world. We are dead to the, the flesh and the blood, and we are alive to the things of the Spirit. Fourthly, as I close, what happened in the upper room was an open heaven experience. An open heaven is a nearness of heaven to earth, a joining of heaven to the believer. What happened in the upper room? What happens under an open heaven? A different way of living is introduced to us. Isaiah 64 and verse 1. We'll look at it next time. What happened? In an open heaven, we begin to see and understand 
the mysteries of Almighty God. Listen to me. Tongues is so important. Tomorrow I travel down to my friend Tony in Warwick, about two hours from here. He has been suffering from unbelievable pain. And we're going to spend the day and the night there and we will spend all day speaking in tongues until we break this thing that is over his life. Not a five minute prayer like most churches, not a five or a 15 minute prayer like most Christians. But we're going there to break this thing and we will speak in tongues for literally hours. But there's more in the upper room. Heaven itself opens. The throne room itself opens. We are invited. We are taken, in fact. We are taken into the throne room of God. It's interesting, and we'll cover this perhaps next time, but the Lord's Prayer said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What's he talking about there? Exactly this, an open heaven. He's talking about his kingdom coming in us so that it can be released out of us. Father Almighty, as we close this session today, I come before you and right now, there are sick people who are listening to this. There are people that have fear right now because of the coronavirus, because of other situations. Fear is of the other spirit. Fear is of Satan. There are only two spirits, the Holy Spirit and the Satanic Spirit. Anything that is negative is of the Satanic Spirit. Father, we break the fear. We break the worry. We break the anxiety. Those that have cancer, we have seen people healed of cancer through their screen on the computer. Father, reach out to them right now because you are not limited to a screen. But Lord, for Kapasaka, Holy Ghost, release your glory right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Shaka Baba Sakaya. Oria la Baba Sakaya. Baba Sakaya. E Baba Sikia. Well, praise God. If you felt the Holy Spirit upon you right then and you feel the healing flow through your body, text us, write to us in the side, let us know. Continue to pray for my friend Tony. Pray for us tomorrow as we travel down and spend the day and night praying for him. Pray that every evil spirit will be totally destroyed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Love you.